Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. I felt really upset when I found out my fiancé cheated on me while we were planning our wedding. It made me sad, but also a bit relieved because at least I found out before we got married. Even though I was hurt, I wanted to get back at her, so I did something about it. After we had a great performance on stage, we felt really happy and proud. We cheered and hugged each other, feeling like excited teenagers. Our band, Starhawk, was the opening act for a big show in Lansing. My we were thrilled to prove ourselves as one of the best local bands. Our performance was amazing. We got the crowd really excited and got lots of applause when we finished. But then I noticed my fiance, Catherine, wasn't there. I started to worry. When she finally showed up, she seemed a bit nervous. Her makeup looked perfect, but her hair was messy, which was unusual for her. She kissed me quickly and I could smell something strange on her. She didn't even mention how well we did on stage, probably because she hadn't seen it. We packed up our stuff and listened to the next band perform quietly backstage. They were really good, and I hope we could be as successful as them someday. I noticed their drummer, Bobby Lee, glancing over at Catherine several times, even giving her a wink once or twice. When he caught me observing him, he smirked arrogantly, not bothering to conceal it. I suppose when you're Bobby Lee, you believe you can get away with anything. At this stage in their career, Ravage Crew was on the brink of becoming legendary, Bobby Lee himself was already a legend, known not only for his drumming skills, but also for his reputation as a ladies' man with a well-endowed physique. It was widely known that Bobby Lee had been intimate with several list actresses and could effortlessly charm women with a snap of his fingers. I couldn't help but wonder if he even needed to snap his fingers to win over Catherine. I approached Steve slowly. He paid no attention to me for about half a minute, gazing straight ahead, before finally acknowledging me. He whispered to me, she left the tour bus right after you performed. Bobby Lee went out a few minutes before her. All dressed up for the show, he said with a big smile on his face. She probably had to fix herself up a bit. Darn, I couldn't say much more than that. Our team left not long after the break and headed to our favorite place to celebrate. The State Street Bar and Grill. The place was kind of empty because most of the regulars were at the concert. When we walked in, people greeted us like we were champions returning home. It seemed like everyone knew someone who had been to the concert, and those who weren't there were busy texting and taking pictures of our performance. Even though I was feeling upset inside, I tried to stay calm on the outside so I could figure out my next steps. I didn't need to avoid Catherine because she seemed guilty and kept her distance without making it too obvious. I found a quiet corner at the far end of the bar and took a sip of expensive Angel Envy Rye Whiskey. It cost a lot, but after our successful performance tonight, it felt worth it. Looking at the clock on the wall, I thought about how quickly things had changed. In less than three hours, we finished our soundcheck early, and then Vince Null, the bass player from another band, invited us and our partners onto their tour bus for a drink before the show. I knew the crew members were interested in our partners, they were all attractive. My wife Catherine, for example, is stunning. She's like a Greek goddess with long, dark brown hair and olive skin. Tonight, she looked amazing in a tight blue dress and matching heels. Our group got off the tour bus 10 minutes before our performance was supposed to start, but our partners stayed behind with the film crew guys, Jay, our lead guitarist, and I felt uneasy about it, but our partners reassured us that everything would be okay and they'd only stay for a little while. Are you sure? Jay asked, and they all nodded. So, we went to get ready for the show. Damn it. I muttered as I left the bar, got into the car, and headed home. Without his bride, it was only five minutes after returning home before our home phone rang. Guess who? Hi, baby. Where did you go? I turned around and you were gone, Catherine said. And are you surprised? I retorted. You slept with Bobby Lee tonight. You're in the past. I slammed the phone down on the hook. That should have been a hint. She rushed through the door 30 minutes later, her makeup smudged from tears. We need to talk, baby, she cried, tears streaming down her face. Can you fix this, Catherine? Can you? I shouted at her. She collapsed onto the sofa, burying her face in her hands. He's Bobby Lee. Baby, he's a legend, she pleaded. And why should that matter to me? I retorted. He's Bobby Lee, the Bobby Lee. She insisted, expecting me to be proud to share her with him. I couldn't refuse him. Of course not, I replied, dripping with sarcasm. He's been with actresses and supermodels. And that's supposed to justify you cheating on me with him. I interrupted. At first, she looked confused, but then she understood what I meant. 
Anger showed on her face. Former. Fiancé. Come on, Simon, she said loudly. Everything's all set and paid for. We're getting married in three months from tomorrow. We're going to be married in three months from tomorrow. Honey, I'm not marrying Bobby Lee's latest fling, I said. My father will be really angry, she warned. We have 500 guests coming to the wedding. My parents have invested a fortune in this. Did I mention that Catherine is the daughter of Cameron and Twyla Jefferson from the esteemed Boston Jefferson family? One of the most affluent and influential families in the city. I can't believe I overlooked that detail, as her parents make sure to remind me of it nearly every other day. Despite knowing them for about 18 months, it feels like they've emphasized their wealth and social status in Boston society at least three dozen times. I wasn't exactly their top choice for a son-in-law. While my day job as a chemical engineer at a small firm in Lansing paid a six-figure salary, and my burgeoning music career was bringing in decent money with potential for more, I knew I'd never measure up to the esteemed Jeffersons of Boston. At best, I was tolerated. But perhaps that's how it should be. In Punxsutawney, PA, the most famous thing is a groundhog. My family has six people, but we don't have much money altogether. We've been in the United States for four generations. We came here from somewhere in Central Europe a long time ago. The Jefferson, though, have been in America since the early days. They got rich through things like banking and trading, and by being friends with English rich people before the Revolution. I met Catherine in our junior year at Michigan State. She was studying public relations. We first met at a party with a 50s theme. She came with a guy who thought he was Elvis Presley, but he was pretty serious and not very relaxed. Things took a sour turn when he, perhaps fueled by too much alcohol, bumped into me, causing me to spill my beer. He tried to start a fight, but I quickly stopped it, leaving him unconscious on the floor. Catherine chose to leave the party with me that night. After three months of dating, we became intimate and committed to each other. I proposed to her on our one-year anniversary. Our journey together hasn't always been smooth sailing. Catherine, aware of her beauty and coming from a privileged background, sometimes carries an air of entitlement. This has caused friction between her and some of my less refined friends. She fails to understand why I maintain those friendships if I truly love her. In response, I challenge her by asking why she never goes by nicknames like Kathy, Cat, or Kate. She always says, that's not who I am, I reply simply, but that's exactly who you are. I snap back to reality when Catherine begged me desperately, please, Simon, I love you, only you. We can fix everything. Do you love me? Really? How could you hurt me so much if you love me? I protested. It wasn't about love, Sai. It was just a chance with Bobby Lee and his 12-inch thing, I spat out. I get it. Catherine, even though I don't, I said. She blushed deeply, seeming like she wanted to say something but couldn't. Tears were falling down her face. It was too cold. Catherine, I said. I'm sorry. See, it's the truth. It was a mistake. Can't we forget one mistake, she pleaded. I put my head in my hands, feeling a sudden headache from all the stress. It broke all the agreement. Baby! And we're not even married yet. I'm not going to spend my whole life wondering if my wife sleeps with every famous guy she meets. And by the way, you really need to take a shower. I hardly slept on the couch that night. I knew that my decision was the right one. What happened tore me apart, but I still loved that stupid woman. By the time Catherine finally emerged from the bedroom, I was halfway through my fifth cup of coffee. It was evident she had a restless night, looking utterly exhausted. I couldn't help but speculate on what troubled her more, my breaking off the engagement or having to confront her parents. After pouring herself a cup of coffee, she settled on the opposite end of the sofa. Can we discuss this further? She asked softly. I'm not sure there's much left to discuss, I replied evenly. It took all my willpower not to react violently to her presence. I'm sorry, Sai. So truly sorry for both betraying you and causing you pain. I was thoughtless and foolish. It was a terrible mistake. My self-control crumbled. A terrible mistake? I exploded. No, this was a colossal mistake. Apologizing, shedding a few tears, and showing remorse won't suffice. Anyway, if we're done here, your parents are expecting your call. Oh, God. You've already talked to them? She choked out. I felt they deserved to know the truth. And I didn't trust you to do it. It was really sad for them to find out that their perfect daughter was with a famous rock star. Your mom looked really embarrassed, maybe thinking about how she'd explain it to her friends over tea. And your dad. I thought he might have a heart attack. No dad would want to hear that about his daughter. Her crying got louder and turned into full-on sobs. 
Oh no, oh no, oh no, I can't believe you betrayed me like that, she cried out. Did you really think I'd take the blame for what you did just because you wanted to take up Bobby Lee's offer? Let's be realistic here, especially when your dad is counting every penny he spent on this wedding. At least he said sorry to me for your, um, mistake, as he called it, right before he said he never wants to see me again. And if he does, he might have one of his security guys hurt me. Luckily, I'm not the one who messed up here. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to Boomer's place to talk with the guys about our upcoming gigs, and maybe someone will know a place I can stay for a while. Two weeks later, I found a new place to live, and Catherine was out of my life. It hurt, but I was young and knew I'd feel better eventually, even though the bandmates tease me for the next year by hiding rulers in my car and gear. That's just how they show affection. The end? Well, almost. One Saturday morning, about eight weeks after splitting up with Catherine, I came back to my apartment after a five-mile run. The phone started ringing and didn't stop until I picked up. Surprised. Hello, I gasped, still catching my breath from the jog. Sigh, is that you? You sound like you're on the verge of a heart attack or something, Catherine replied. Consciously slowing my breathing, I realized my ex fiance was on the other end of the line. We hadn't spoken since I moved out following our broken engagement due to her infidelity. I wasn't thrilled to hear her voice. What does she want now? Echoed in my mind. I just finished my Saturday morning run. I retorted, What do you want? Silence met my abrupt response. I knew my hostile answer likely caught her off guard. Um, see, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I need to tell you that I'm pregnant. This time, the silence on the phone line belonged to me. I stared at the receiver, almost expecting to discern the words traveling through the line. My mouth was probably agape, and I'm uncertain how my legs managed to support me. Why are you calling me, Catherine? We're no longer together, I replied flatly, failing to grasp the gravity of the situation. Um, this didn't happen suddenly, Simon. I'm about two months pregnant. Yesterday, my doctor confirmed what the home test showed, Catherine said. I have to admit, I was really surprised. It felt like everything in my life suddenly didn't make sense. With the long phone cord in my hand, I stumbled to my small kitchen and sat on a stool. I'm going to keep this baby, she said firmly. My parents and I expect you to take care of our child. I'll take care of our child. Even if your parents don't like me, I said back. Then I realized something. But you're assuming it's my child. I have doubts about that. Catherine, two months ago, you were with Bobby Lee, and I know you weren't using protection that night. I checked your nightstand drawer when I got home that night, out of anger and curiosity. But we also had intimate moments several nights before that, and I wasn't using contraception then either. She retorted. Maybe, maybe not, I replied. An amniocentesis could provide clarity in a couple of months. Medical professionals still have concerns about the safety of those tests, she stated. Well, then I suppose we'll have to wait until the baby is born for confirmation, I said. Until then? Listen, Sai, we could reconcile and I'll spend the rest of our lives making it up to you. I'm sorry, Sai. I love you. You didn't demonstrate that love when it mattered. By being more careful, I countered. I think there was a possibility that Catherine and I could be intimate without using a diaphragm, and the baby could be mine. I didn't think it was likely, but I was prepared to take responsibility if it turned out to be true. However, I wasn't willing to raise another man's child, especially one father by Bobby Lee. A week later, I received an unexpected phone call. Very unexpected. In fact, Cameron Jefferson asked to meet me at his office. Well, who am I kidding? He demanded that I meet him at his office after work the next day. I wasn't thrilled about being summoned like that, but more than anything, I was curious. Of course, the thought did cross my mind that he might be setting me up for trouble. When Cameron's security personnel escorted me into his office, I felt cautious. I was directed to a seat opposite Cameron who sat behind his expansive desk. In front of him stood a glass of what appeared to be some high-quality liquor in an exquisite leaded crystal glass. That's Pappy Van Winkle, 23-year-old bourbon, my boy. The epitome of sipping whiskey. You'll never taste anything smoother in your life. In my rather immodest opinion, Cameron remarked, It's my way of introducing you to one of life's finer pleasures, which could be yours, once our business negotiation concludes. Cameron, because he loves his daughter so much, offered me a good job with a million dollar salary and lots of benefits. He even gave me a big house near Boston, so his daughter and her husband could take care of their baby. He wanted to keep it a secret that his daughter got pregnant by Bobby Lee. Even though I'm not that important, he wanted me to say I was the baby's dad before people found out about his daughter and Bobby Lee. 
I listened carefully to what Cameron said, and I felt really embarrassed because I actually thought about his offer. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a millionaire right away? And I could keep my wife too. But wait. What? Why on earth would I even consider that? Sure, she was attractive, but I could find other attractive women. Ones who wouldn't betray me. Ones who weren't already carrying Bobby Lee's child. Admittedly, I might not come across other women with the pedigree of being Jefferson's from Boston, but at least I could look at myself in the mirror without feeling ashamed. I politely declined Cam Jefferson's offer. He acknowledged my decision, mentioning that not many people in their 20s would refuse the amount of money he was offering. Come Jefferson's behavior was far from friendly when he bent over the trunk of the car was forcibly pushed into. I should have dealt with you right here, you little troublemaker. You just couldn't help but embarrass us, couldn't you? Even if I hadn't been disoriented by the punches, handcuffed and shoved into the trunk of a car, I would have had no idea what he meant. I replied with the only coherent thought that came to my mind. Hmm. This caused a few more light punches too from one of Cam's guards. My left eye was rapidly closing and I was having difficulty breathing. Cam erupted in fury, shouting and striking me with a rolled up newspaper as though I were a disobedient puppy, albeit with a level of force that could incapacitate even the most resilient canine. After the assault, he unfurled the paper to reveal the front page, the notorious national unmistakably pregnant, alongside a headline speculating about her relationship with Bobby Lee and the possibility of her bearing his child. I had nothing to do with this, I protested through bloodied lips. I swear, why on earth would I willingly expose myself as a cuckold to the world? I have a good income and I aspire to find a partner who isn't promiscuous. His blows ceased, though I braced myself for more. I waited nervously before I finally opened my eyes and saw Cam pacing behind the car. Well, that actually makes sense, he admitted finally. It's probably one of the other guys in the band, or maybe one of their partners. I'll check it out. You guys take him to the nearest hospital and make sure to send me the bill. One of the tough guys pulled me out of the trunk and put me in the back seat of the car. I left blood on the leather seats as they drove me to the hospital and left me there without saying sorry. Just to clear things up, no, I didn't try to get Cam arrested. That wouldn't have worked in Boston anyway. And Cam had bigger problems than getting arrested for hurting me. The media talked about Catherine for six months, treating her like she wanted to be famous like Kim Kardashian. I can only imagine the toll it took on her mother Twyla, who prided herself on being a Bostonian Jefferson through and through. I'm certain she made Cam's life miserable during those six months. He truly deserved it. Catherine returned to Boston shortly after the scandal broke. She married and divorced three times and had four children with four different men, one of whom turned out to be Bobby Lee. It's been a while since I left Catherine, and I haven't been seeing anyone regularly. Then, one Friday night before our concert, one of the guys from the band opened People magazine to a photo of Bobby Lee and his latest fascination with my gear. The joke was tired, but guys have their ways. We milk a joke dry before letting it go. Ha ha, good one, guys. That's really funny, I said sarcastically as I reached for the magazine, planning to throw it away. But when I looked at the photos and the story, something caught my eye. I wasn't really interested in Bobby Lee's love life, but the third photo got my attention. Bobby Lee, the family guy, was posing with his girlfriend and his mom. His mom was really beautiful for her age. She was in her 50s with long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a body that would make younger women jealous. I put the magazine in my bag with a grin like the Grinches after stealing Christmas toys. Over the next month, I did some research on Bobby Lee, or rather his family. It turned out they lived in Columbus, Ohio. Laura Nostrand, also known as Moms Lee, had divorced Carl Nostrand, or Pops Lee, years ago. Their marriage of two decades ended due to Carl's attempts to emulate his son's promiscuous a glance at Laura's photos revealed a woman aware of her enduring attractiveness at 52. Her attire boasted shorter hemlines than the typical soccer moms, accentuating her ample cleavage without reservation. The more I scrutinized those images, the more I reluctantly acknowledged my own attraction, until a realization struck me like a sudden blow. Both my bandmates and colleagues expressed regret at my transfer to the Columbus oh, office. I feigned sadness, too. But truthfully, I was rather pleased. With the promotion came a substantial raise. Plus, two months later, I had a date lined up with none other than Laura Nostrand. Meeting Laura seemed like a lucky coincidence. She was at a local place with her friend Sue, and Laura was known there because she was Bobby Lee's mom. I expected her to be there based on my research. When they got there around 8, I sent drinks to their table. They noticed me with a nod, 
but I stayed at the bar until Laura came up to me. You're either really brave or maybe you need glasses, she said with a charming voice. We're old enough to be your mom. Yeah, I agreed. But if my mom looked like you, I'd be in trouble. Oh, stop it, she laughed. I spent the rest of the evening having a good time with the two women. It seemed evident that they were also having a good time. Before parting ways, I exchanged numbers with Laura and received assurance that they would join me again at the restaurant the following Friday night. On the subsequent Friday, I was quite certain that Laura had dressed with me in mind. Her black dress, cat to mid-thigh, draped elegantly over her his. She wore a black lace bra, which, much to everyone's notice, was prominently displayed throughout the evening. Sue's attire was more understated, perhaps intentionally so, as she played the role of a supportive friend, or wing woman, staying somewhat in the background. Laura appeared less concerned about our age disparity and became increasingly affectionate, frequently touching my arms and shoulders. While we touched on personal topics, neither she nor Sue mentioned her well-known son. I too refrained from broaching the subject, though I harbored a hidden agenda. As the clock neared midnight and they bid farewell, Sue gave me a warm hug while Laura bestowed upon me an even more intimate embrace and a gentle kiss on the lips. I called Laura to set up a date for next week, and she said yes after a short pause. I said, Are you sure? Cheeky? What would your mom say if she knew you were dating someone her age? Laura asked. She'd probably tell me to be polite and hold doors for you, just like she would if you were 18 or 35 or probably the same age as her, Laura laughed. You can try to guess, but I'm not telling you my age or my weight. Didn't your mom teach you that there are certain things you shouldn't ask a woman? Bra size, I replied. Age, weight, and bra size. But if you prefer not to wear it, then I don't need to worry about it. At my age, which I still do not disclose, I do not find it attractive to walk without it. Girls are not as perky as they were at my age, she said. I think you underestimate yourself. A little strictness will not hurt the appearance. Most guys will appreciate the look without it. Try it and tell me by the end of the evening that I'm wrong. Cheeky and persistent. I suppose this is what I get for spending time with a young man, she concluded. She looked amazing when she met me at the door the following Friday. She was wearing an emerald green dress that accentuated every curve. Hey, she said, my eyes are here. Young man? Yes, but something else caught my attention. Right here, I replied, grinning. Just tell me I don't look good. It's ridiculous, she said in a hoarse voice. You look absolutely amazing. Irresistible, I whispered. I tried my best to impress Laura, starting with dinner at Pascalone's, the best Italian restaurant in Ohio. Then we went to Swing Columbus, a lively jazz and blues club with a dance floor. I may not be the best dancer, but I can keep up. And I knew that most women like to dance. She seemed to be having a great time. I also found that she appreciates good spirits savoring the 18-year-old Glenn Moringi single malt, as it should be pure and delicious. We conversed throughout the evening, yet the topic of her famous son never arose. I also refrained from mentioning my profession as a musician. It was probably the best date I've ever been on. At the end of the evening, she gave me a gentle kiss on the lips, and we planned to meet again next Saturday. Our next date lasted until Sunday afternoon. We had planned to go out for dinner and dancing, but she suggested we go back to her place for drinks and dessert instead. I openly admired her body and didn't try to hide it. She smiled coyly whenever she caught me looking at her, which happened a lot. You really boost the confidence of an older woman, you know that? She said at one point during the evening. Just doing my part, I replied. We shared about half a bottle of Glenfiddich 18-year-old single malt whiskey, along with her homemade New York-style cheesecake. To my surprise, she also had a talent for baking. During our conversation, she casually mentioned that her son was Bobby Lee, the renowned drummer of Ravaged Crew. I feigned astonishment, having previously mentioned my own involvement in music as a part-time musician. However, she soon revealed the truth about her son. I confessed that we had crossed paths briefly years ago when I resided in Michigan. I expressed my admiration for Ravaged Crew, which was genuine until an undisclosed incident involving my fiance. We ended up in her bed, at first, she was a little shy about her body, given her advanced age, but she quickly overcame this as soon as she saw that I found her body attractive. We had a great night. I awoke in the embrace of an extraordinary woman, a goddess in her own right. We began to fill our leisure time predominantly in each other's company. I sensed her attraction towards me mirrored my own feelings for her. This was certainly not part of our initial intentions. I must confess, my initial motive for pursuing Bobby Lee's mother was rooted in vengeance. 
but what transpired with Laura went far beyond revenge. She captured my heart. Initially, I contemplated keeping silent about our relationship, fearing potential repercussions if she ever crossed paths with my parents, but I realized the necessity of honesty if this relationship was to progress. Admitting the truth wouldn't be simple. It took me three weeks to muster the courage to broach the subject. When I finally spoke, we were both naked, just after we had a private moment together. It felt like the right time to tell her how I really felt. We were lying in bed facing each other, both breathing heavily. Laura gave me a small smile. I could tell she had given me everything, like she always did. I, I need to tell you something. Laura, I started, stumbling over my words, and I want you to wait until I'm done before you say anything. Can you do that? She looked at me closely and nervously. She nodded and I flinched. I told her the whole story about her son and my ex-fiance. Then I told her about my plan for revenge, and her eyes widened and filled with tears. You jerk, she began, but I put a finger to her lips, silencing her. I never planned on falling in love with you. Laura, you've ruined everything because of me, I said. Tears she had been holding back flowed from her eyes. Do you love me? She squeaked. It was my turn to nod. So let me get this straight. My new grandson, whom I haven't even met yet, is the son of my son and your ex-fiance? Are you certain? Pretty wild, I replied. Her expression darkened with sorrow. I'm sorry, Simon, she said. He picked up this behavior from his absentee father, who believed in spreading himself thin with every woman. I tried to instill better values in my son. She winced and looked down, then brightened as she met my gaze. Can we take a step back? She asked. What's on your mind? I inquired. I shrugged. You said you love me? Was that true? She questioned. That's what I said. I murmured. She climbed onto me, and we revisited our evening together. We exchanged a few more kisses before retiring for the night. I awoke to find her emerald eyes fixed on me. She greeted me with a bright smile. Assuming I reciprocate your love, of course, she remarked. I returned her smile. So, what's our next step? She inquired. This is uncharted territory. I'm old enough to be your mother. Isn't that a bit strange? I never thought about it. I realized my mom would probably be surprised to hear about the age difference with my girlfriend. Well, I guess we won't be having kids, I joked. She looked serious. I'm not ready to be a grandmother, she said firmly. Fair enough, I said. But I still think you should marry me. Her expression softened. She looked at me, blinked twice, and then started crying. I did the only thing I could think of I hugged her tightly. We stayed like that for several minutes. I do love you, darling, but marriage isn't in the cards for us. She stated seriously. Why is that? I'm into classic rock. I quipped back, but she returned with a stern gaze. The age gap doesn't faze me, Lore. Sure, you might be as old as my mom, but you're nothing like her. You dress differently, act differently, and honestly, you look younger than her. I reassured, so your mom dresses more modestly. Would you like me to dress like that? She answered back. She's my mom, Lore. You're my girlfriend. And you're pretty, I started. You're nice, too, but you flirt a lot. Let's be honest here. In 10 years, I'll be 62 and not exactly a heartthrob, while you'll be 39. Will you still want to be with an older woman, she asked. Who says you won't still be attractive, and getting older is a choice, Lore? But seriously, I've thought about this. I'd be utterly miserable without you, and I bet you'd feel the same, I affirmed. Yeah, but that doesn't necessitate marriage. Sigh, we can cohabit. It's the norm these days, she suggested. Now it was my turn to give her a firm look. That's not how I see it, Lore. I want you as my wife, my partner for life, my everything. She stared at me in disbelief, shaking her head. I nodded mine. Tears welled up in her eyes once more. Are you sure this isn't some twisted form of revenge? Sigh. My mother had reservations about my desire to marry a woman who was her age, but appeared and behaved a decade younger. Keep your compassory, Daniel. Remember, she's engaged to your son. Mom scolded Dad. Dad blushed deeply. I'm not as bad as the guy who stole C's first fiancé, he quickly retracted. Laura was taken aback. She blushed and stumbled through her own apology for her son. Damn. I didn't plan on explaining all of that, I said quietly. We had a small wedding with just a few friends and family. Yes, she invited her famous son, who came to the wedding. When Laura introduced us, I could tell he didn't remember me at all. I decided not to say anything because I had moved on from seeking revenge, but Laura couldn't resist bringing it up. You and Bobby have at least two things in common, she said, catching his eye. 
You're both musicians, and you both had relations with the same woman, though Simon had the sense not to get her pregnant. Bobby seemed confused, maybe because he was unusually sober. That son of yours with that rich Boston girl, Catherine Jefferson. She was Simon's fiance when you got her pregnant, back when his band was opening for yours in Lansing, right? You're just like your foolish father, Bobby. I thought you were better than this. It cost me millions in child support every year, and her parents are already rich. They're not nice people, Bobby said. Definitely, I agreed. And honestly, I should thank you. I narrowly avoided becoming part of that family by marrying her. Simon stood on the beach, looking at the waves crashing onto the shore of the big island of Hawaii. His wife Laura was waiting for him, smiling brightly as she waved. Even though she was 72, Laura might not have been as young as before, but Simon still thought she looked amazing in her swimsuit. This two-week trip was to celebrate their 20th anniversary. Simon quietly laughed to himself, thinking about how his plan to get back at Bobby Lee had turned into the best revenge. He had a life full of experiences with his real soulmate. Second story is my wife 27F texting male friends cheating. Hi, my wife and I are both in graduate school together, different degrees, but same campus. She recently returned home from a trip over spring break with a mix of guys and girls. It was not a party destination, but I know the group went out to bars and clubs pretty late. I have previously flagged that I feel a bit uncomfortable with my wife getting drunk and going out of without me, but did not say anything. When we were back on campus, my wife decided to go out to some bars with some of our mutual guy and girlfriends. I went home around 10 p.m. She came home at 3.30 a.m. in the morning and was pretty drunk. I've trusted her a lot in the past, but I couldn't help checking her text messages through her iPad when she hadn't come home by 1 a.m. I saw that she had texted two guys at 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. asking them to come to a bar. These two guys are in her program and I briefly met them over dinner last week. Both of them are in serious relationships with people who don't live on campus. She also texted a third guy at 10 p.m. and midnight with the same invitation to come to the bar. I don't know this guy other than that he was on the trip, but my wife hasn't mentioned him before. None of the guys responded, but my wife kept following up saying they should have come because it was like the trip they went on. Eventually, the third guy responded saying he was going out, but my wife and I already had plans so they couldn't meet up. I feel very uneasy about my wife texting guys I barely know asking them to come out to bars when I am not there. I am unsure whether I should bring it up before the manage to meet up on a night that I am not there. How should I bring this up without breaching trust with my wife about reading her texts? Would you classify this as cheating? Am I overreacting? Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.